My name is Carl Middleton and I'm currently the director of the Centre for Social Development Studies here in Bangkok, Thailand at Chulongkorn University. I'm also an assistant professor and teach on the Master of Arts in International Development Studies programme. I've been teaching on the programme for 12 years and most of my uh, research work is focused on to development in the region and in particular the region's environmental politics. Before joining the faculty, I was working with civil society groups, first in Cambodia, and then after that based in Thailand, also working on uh, energy and water governance in the region. Previously, I graduated from the University of Manchester, first with a, uh, an undergraduate in civil engineering, and then a PhD in environmental chemistry that has led me on this path to working in environmental politics. There are many Mekong regions. Um, they've been, it's been referred to in different ways at different points in time. So, I mean, one way, the obvious way of thinking about it is that it's mainland Southeast Asia. So the countries of Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar. Um, it's also been framed as something called the Greater Mekong Subregion, which is an idea that was put forward by the Asian Development Bank in the 1990s. And that's primarily an economic construct. And that, that includes several provinces of China as well, and it more promoted economic trade and investment, although more recently has addressed environmental and social issues. Um, but then when we talk about the Mekong Basin, then that also includes Yunnan province of uh, China and into the Tibetan Plateau, because the Mekong flows through six countries. Why is the Mekong uh, important, or the Mekong Lanchang River? Well, it's a river that has great value to many different groups, and I think it's important to recognize that there are competing interests. So on the one hand, um, around 70 million people live within the basin and have a range of different interactions with the river. Um, but probably what might come most to mind are rural livelihoods and the way that wild capture fisheries and riverbank gardening and small-scale irrigated agriculture are supported by the river and support people's lives. But then there's another uh, vision for the basin, which involves larger scale projects. So whether we're talking about large scale hydropower dams uh, or large scale um, irrigation schemes. So these are very different scale of uh, thinking about the basin. One thing that's interesting about this is that the, it also then connects with the wider region. For example, hydropower projects that are built uh, within the basin often send their electricity to the major urban centers like Bangkok or Ho Chi Minh City that are outside the basin. Then I think another important value of the basin that isn't discussed enough, but that we should foreground, is that it's an incredibly biodiverse river. And um, it's second in biodiversity only to the Amazon. And this biodiversity includes some of the world's largest freshwater species, like the Mekong giant catfish and the giant freshwater stingray. So I think I mean, when we talk about the value of the river, we also need to see that it's teeming with life and that all of these diverse forms of life need to be taken into account. It's not talked about enough. I think that climate change and global heating are gonna be one of the uh, key drives or key dynamics that will shape the future of the river. Um, UN Water, uh, the UN agency responsible that uh, focuses on water has said that water will be one of the main means by which climate change will be experienced around the world. And I think one of the insights that they've highlighted, which is salient to this region, is that it will intersect and exacerbate existing challenges, whether we're talking about the biophysical challenges or we're talking about the governance challenges. So whilst climate science is still has a range of different predictions, broadly within the Mekong Basin, we can say that there'll be an average temperature increase of about 0.8 degrees Celsius that will be especially foul in the upland areas. And this is significant to the Mekong Basin because it's in China in the Tibetan Plateau where the glacier packs are that will experience the greatest heating and that will affect dry season flows. There's also be more extreme weather events of flood and drought. And this in itself will be a challenge that is already partly being experienced in the fact that the last two years, 2019 and 2020, have been some of the worst droughts in living memory in the region. And then other challenges that are significant. Um, in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, it's a very, very low-lying area. And so the sea level rise is also expected to severely affect the Mekong Delta region. So the combination of the changes in the wider basin with the rising sea level 
are going to create many challenges. So whether we're talking about the challenges in terms of transboundary governance and local governance and the outcomes of whether they're fair and just, or whether we're talking about the, um, the physical changes that will happen and the impacts on people's livelihoods, we can expect in the coming decades that this will become one of the defining features or one of the defining challenges for the basin. Given that the Mekong Langchang River is a transboundary river, it means that there should be uh, institutions uh, between states in order to govern it inclusively and effectively. So there have been, there are several organizations that have been, uh, have that mandate. The first is the Mekong River Commission, which uh, was established in 1995, and it's a treaty-based organization. Um, on paper, it's to work towards sustainable development in the basin. Um, the Mekong River Commission has four members, which is uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And it has a secretariat that's currently in Vientiane, in Laos. Um, so some of the strengths of the MRC, uh, it has been, it's produced a lot of research and knowledge. The fact that it's treaty-based also gives a clear set of expectations about how transboundary water governance would take place. Um, and it has provided a focal point when some uh, contentious issues have arisen about sharing the Mekong River, uh, most recently the Mekong mainstream dams that I think we could discuss a bit later. Um, but then the MRC is not a perfect organization. It's also had a number of challenges. Uh, perhaps one that is uh, most present in the media is the, uh, the difficulties in facilitating uh, deep public participation when these types of controversial projects have been proposed. But then another challenge, a very key challenge for the MRC has been that China is not a full member. It has only been a dialogue partner. Um, but in 2016, China launched with um, the downstream countries, the Lanchang Mekong Cooperation Framework. And it's a broader mandate than just the MRC, which focuses primarily on water and sustainable development. The Lanchang Mekong Cooperation includes economic cooperation and cultural and political cooperation. But one of the five pillars of the LMC is around water. So this raises a new challenge for the basin, which is how do the mandates between the MRC and the LMC become differentiated? But then it's important to note that beyond those two organizations that have the, maybe the clearest mandate for water, there are a whole range of other organizations. Um, for example, there is the uh, Mekong US partnership that was just launched that is um, replacing a previous initiative called, initiative called the Lower Mekong Initiative. So this is a US partnership with the downstream countries, uh, not including China. Um, there's the Japan Mekong, the Korea Mekong, the India Mekong, um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, the Greater Mekong Subregion Program. So many of these are more about facilitating regional investment and trade. And many of those have consequences for water, but don't address water so directly. The Mekong region has long been subjected to the influences of great powers and interests um, that shape the region's geopolitics. Uh, since, I would say, definitely since early this year, early 2020, there has been an, an intensification of competition in the region between China and the US. And this has partly materialized around uh, the governing of the Mekong Lanchang River. Um, so one initial uh, step that revealed these geopolitics was when a, a scientific study was published that was funded by the US that looked at the changes of the Mekong River and related it to the operation of hydropower projects upstream in China. Uh, so the study used remote sensing because at the time uh, data was not publicly available about the water storage and also um, the operation of the projects. But this was a, um, a hot issue because of the regions uh, was facing a severe drought at the time. Uh, so the study was actually a longer duration study and it showed how uh, since uh, at least 2012 and the commissioning of the larger projects, uh, the river has become increasingly uh, variable in the way that the uh, water flow has gone across borders. Um, but then this report was also picked up, uh, as you might expect, by media uh, and by civil society groups, both US-based and in the region, um, and led to a very, very intense discussion about the impact of China's dams on the downstream. 
and whether the region's drought was being uh, exacerbated by water being stored in China. Um, some, of, some of the media stories interpreted findings to, to mean that. Um, this was also taken up as a political issue with um, some of the US embassies also uh, pointing blame towards China towards the drought. And then as you might also expect, um, China responded vigorously uh, defending its, its interests and uh, basically denying that it was causing the drought. There are now dozens of large hydropower projects that have been built across the Mekong Lanchang Basin. There's at least 12 in the upper basin in China. Uh, there are two that have been completed on the lower Mekong in Laos, but then there are also dozens of tributary projects across the basin. And this has changed the ecology, it's changed the hydrology of the basin, um, and then also affected people's livelihoods. So we can't really call it a model of sustainable development. It supported economic growth across the region, but then at the same time it's come at great ecological and social cost. In the current time, there's a lot of new options that are available, especially when it comes to meeting uh, energy demand. So first of all, there are new technologies, um, whether we're talking about solar or blockchain solar, demand side management, energy efficiency. But I think also very important is there are new uh, ways of governing electricity as well. So the, move, uh, the push for integrated resources planning, and especially the value of public participation in power planning. An important reason for cooperation on a transboundary river like the Mekong Lanchang is the fact that it's a transboundary commons. So the basis of it being a commons means that it has to be shared between the different actors along the river. Now, internationally, um, there's a recently passed uh, UN convention, the UN Watercourses Convention, that shares uh, or that details the principles by which rivers could be shared. Um, so in this region, uh, I would say that the MRC's Mekong Agreement, signed in 90, 1995, broadly reflects already the principles of the UN Watercourses Convention. But of the lower countries, um, it's only Vietnam that has actually ratified the convention so far. And unfortunately, uh, China voted against the original convention. But more recently, China has indicated that it's open to negotiating and to cooperating more on the, on the Mekong. So I think that the UN Watercourses Convention could be the entry point to starting those discussions. But I think it's also important to recognize that, or to acknowledge, that it's not just intergovernmental cooperation that's important when we talk about sharing water. It's actually cooperation between communities and between states and communities that will lead to a, a better or more substantial and a fairer outcome when it comes to sharing rivers. Another important point that mustn't be forgotten is that there's a legacy of the existing projects. And in, in many ways, projects that have been built in the past have produced the poverty of the present for those that have been affected. So I think there has to be a process of examining what the impacts have been and providing fair compensation and really looking at how to support people to recover their livelihoods for the future. And then the final point I think that's also important is to really look carefully at the current paradigm of water governance and really think about whether nature is represented enough. So there's a growing movement around the world to recognize the rights of nature. What that means is that nature should have its own legal standing within the ways that um, public policy and laws and plans are prepared. And I, I think that this paradigm is, as we become increasingly aware, including due to climate change, of how related humans are to their environment, I think the rights of nature is a good step forward to start rethinking our relationship with nature and starting having public policy that really includes non-human life within it.